Hello, how are you doing today? I'll tell you, I've been having a rough time. I, I thought that by now, all this COVID business would be in the rear view mirror, but it's not. We have a resurgence going on and it sure does take a lot of patience and endurance. And there just seems to be so much tension and so much uncertainty. I mean, the question over and over, when? When will it all be over? When will we be able to meet in person and worship together again? I mean, we're working on maybe having a drive-up church, a drive-in type of church where we can listen to the messages and prayers over our radio. We're working some kinks out of that. But you know, my life it seems to have been focused in circles around worship. And we can't worship, it leaves me just kind of adrift in some ways, and it's been really rough on me. And there's just so many tensions. The tensions of, well, what are we gonna do with our schools? How is that gonna look? And some are still worried about their jobs, and how, how are they gonna be able to continue to work? And just staying healthy in general. It just Can I stay healthy and not get this uh, virus? And can we, Continue to go to restaurants again. When will we have entertainment again? Uh, and you know, you try to connect with others, maybe going online, but what you find online, you're trying to find your friends and pictures of your friends, but in between all that, you just find so much hatred and so much politics and so much selfishness, it's just frustrating. Uh, and so many are separated and it is, it's hard to be in isolation and it's hard to be separated. And then others are together. And you know, there is a little bit of difficulty of being together all the time as well. Uh, we joke about, uh, well, in nine months we'll have all these babies. Well, that, uh, that may be. But the other side of that coin is that uh, being together all the time and having all these tensions going on around us can lead to a lot of anger and short tempers, and I'm concerned that maybe you'd have domestic violence in many homes. And if, by the way, you are experiencing domestic violence in any way, call the police, get some help. Call one of the church leaders and get some advice. You should never have to live with physical abuse. You shouldn't even have to live with verbal abuse. Uh, so, so get some help. And I, I mentioned that, one of the reasons I mentioned that is because I'm gonna be in 1 Peter 3 today, which talks about wives be submissive to your husbands. And like all the scriptures, this one has been twisted sometimes to try to justify male dominance and, and male abuse, and that's not what it does at all. Of course, if you torture any scripture long enough, it will say anything you want it to say. And people will twist this to try to justify their actions and it doesn't say what they want it to say. And so I mention it for that reason. So let's go into our text of 1 Peter 3 and, and read that. He begins by saying, in the same way, likewise. He, he goes back to what he's already been talking about. And sometimes we just have to step back and look at the broader context. This is the problem we have of uh, picking out a verse here and a verse there, is we miss sometimes the broader context. And here we, we need to step back and see the, the big, big context of the Bible itself. The Bible is about redemption. It's about salvation. It's about the relationship that was lost at the very beginning in the Garden of Eden. God created us in Genesis 1, 26 and 27. He created male and female in his image. There was equality there. Both were gifted with many gifts. And then came the fall of man. And with the fall of man, we see so much selfishness and sin. And read those few chapters of Genesis, you see male domination and manipulation. And we see that continuing till today, and redemption is God trying to reestablish a relationship with us. And for us Christians, that's what we have found, this relationship with God. And nothing is more wonderful in our hearts and in our minds than this relationship we have with God. And this relationship we have with God is going to end in another garden. 
the book of Revelation ends with this Garden of Eden already restored again. And we live in paradise. We live with God once again. And so in the same ways, he's been talking about submission in the broader context. And we struggle with submission. It's so hard because it's a fight with our pride. That little lawyer in our brain begins to look for loopholes and I object. This is not fair. And uh, verse 13, it talks about being subject to the government. And then he starts talking about being subject to your masters. But the overall context, to look even bigger, in verse 13, he says, this is for the Lord's sake. And verse 20, this finds favor with God. Why do we submit? Well, it's because of the kingdom of God. It is because of the broader context of evangelism and the kingdom of God and it helping it. And now, not because we are weak or because we lack dignity or we're without worth, but to lift up the kingdom of God in evangelism. And verse 21 and following, it finds its ultimate example in Jesus submitting himself to the heavenly father and submitting himself to the Roman Empire and being crucified for our sins. He did it for the kingdom of God. He didn't come for himself, he came for others. And we're called to walk in his steps that we begin to live not for ourselves, but for others. So he begins in the same way, in this submissive way. In the same way, you wives be submissive to your own husbands so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. Your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on dresses, let, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. For in this way, in former times, the holy women also who hoped in God used to adorn themselves being submissive to their own husbands. Just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. This is about redemption. It is about that unbelieving partner. Uh, in that first century, you had many people who uh, were not Christians, and then one would hear the message and they would become Christians. And you would be... Uh, spiritually single and what happens when you're spiritually single like this when one's a believer and one's an unbeliever and the question is asking and Paul tries to answer it in 1 Corinthians 7 should you separate no stay together because now there's hope that you can convert your mate there's hope that their children can become Christians and so we have this situation coming up in Peter and so how can you convert your husband, that's the question. How can you convert your husband? And Peter says it's, it's going to be won by your behavior. Uh, and what we have is this contrast between selfishness versus uh, selfishness. We're going to either demand our rights and do our way and live our way, or we can be submissive to the will of God and be submissive to others around us. The whole point here, how to win your husband. Nagging, <laughs> nagging doesn't work. We just got through Proverbs and we saw Solomon's, uh, Solomon's condemnation, how unbearable it is to live with a contentious woman. It's like the dripping of the rain. It's better to live on the housetop. It's better to live in a desert than, than to live with that. Nagging doesn't work. And, and he says they can be won without a word, by the behavior, he says, as they observe Christianity in you, as they see how Christianity has made a difference in your life, as they see the transformation being made in your life, it, it becomes attractive to them. Verse 3, he talks about this adornment, this external adornment and uh, no doubt he's talking about these elaborate hairstyles that were popular in the Roman Empire. I mean, these were expensive 
hairstyles that were woven with gold and jewels. And he says, it's not just about that. You know, women always like to look good. And they usually do to us men. And they know that men like it when they look good. And they, are, they know that men are attracted to them. And he's just saying, yes, that's nice, but it won't change him. It's not going to affect his heart. And then he begins in verse 4. He says, but let it be the hidden person in your heart that changes him. That hidden person. Isn't that a beautiful metaphor there, that hidden person in your heart? It's not a weak person. It's one that is in control of themselves. It's not that selfish little lawyer that is angry, that is upset, that is aggressive, that says, it's not fair, I want my rights, I demand my rights. It's not this angry person that we see protesting all the things and everything around him, not protesting everything his husband, her husband does, but it is one that is with a gentle and quiet spirit, he says. And then he adds, this is precious in the sight of God. God sees this woman as very precious. I don't like the word precious here because in the English language, it's kind of a flimsy word. It, it, it's kind of a, a pansy type of word. But in the Greek, it is a powerful word. Let me give you an example of this. If you go back to chapter one, in verse seven, he says, so the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, he talks about here a precious faith. Now, this precious faith is precious because it is strong enough to withstand anything. It is going to go through any trial and any barrier is going to overcome anything. It is a powerful faith. Go down to chapter 1, verse 19. He talks about but the precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. He calls the blood of Jesus the precious blood. Now, that blood is more powerful than sin, more powerful than Satan. It is powerful enough to change the world. And he says, this is what women should be focusing on, this precious inner person of their heart. And... Uh, it is a person that is powerful in the eyes of God. But more than this, this is the person who is going to be powerful in the eyes of their husband. And then he begins and continues by saying, well, this is what the holy women of old did. The holy women of old, verse 5, they wore this hidden person. They wore this attitude, and that's what got them through their lives in such a successful way. And he uses Sarah as an example. What do you remember about Sarah? Now, what I know about Sarah is that she was a physically attractive woman. She was a beautiful, gorgeous woman. Even at, after the age of 65, she was beautiful. And it gets them in trouble a couple of times because she's so beautiful that Abraham's afraid that somebody's going to kill him so they can get his wife. And so he lies, has her lie to, to Pharaoh and later to Abimelech, not just once, twice in the scripture. It, it comes out that this is such a, uh, an important part of the story is that she's beautiful. And... She is also, though, a woman of tremendous faith. She's included in this group of heroes of faith in Hebrews, the 11th chapter. Uh, she took her miseries, her troubles, the pain of being childless. She took it all and put it into God's hands. She trusted God. And it is seen in her relationship with her husband, it says. Uh, now, we know the story, Abraham is 75 years old, and he says, you know, we need to move. God has called us to move. And I don't know how that conversation is going to go because she's 65 years old, and when you're 65 years old, I don't think you're ready to make a big move. A couple of years ago, a church contacted me and wanted to know if I would consider being their preacher. 
Uh, I, I told him I'm very flattered by that, but I'm very happy with where I am. I'm in love with these people here. But I, I told him on the other hand, I said, you know, I'm almost 65 years old. I'm not thinking about starting all over again. She's 65 years old, and that's what he's asking her, to leave her family, to leave her friends, to leave her familiar, her familiar surroundings, and go with him. So where are we going to go? Well, I don't know. <laughs> We're going to go wherever God takes us. That she did, she followed Abraham's leadership. In fact, it says here in 1 Peter that she called him Lord. Now, he brings this out because he's just amazed that she would call him that. Now, she doesn't directly call him Lord. Uh, what we have is in Genesis, the 18th chapter, verse 12. It says, Sarah laughed to herself. After I have become old, shall I have pleasure my Lord being also old. She's just been told she's going to have a child in her old age. And she says, at my age, will I have the pleasure? And will my Lord? Uh, this is a term of respect in the ancient times. She has a tremendous respect for her husband. Uh, she is beautiful. But Peter says, you know what? The prettiest feature that she has is that inner person that is quiet and gentle, that one of respect and submission that she has. And God blessed her because of that. And you will be blessed too if you could be submissive without any fear, without what if it doesn't work? What if it makes it worse? What if I'm not happy? What if he makes bad decisions? Put your hope and your trust, not in your husband, not in yourself, but put it in God. That's what he's talking about. So why submit? Why should we submit to the government or, or to our boss or to our husband? Uh, why do we submit at all? Well, it's for the sake of the kingdom of God. It is to reach people with the gospel of Jesus. And let me give you just a little preview of next week in verse 7. He starts off, you husbands, in the same way. Likewise, husbands are to be submissive as well. Uh, in the same way, submissive. You say, you're going to spend four weeks talking about submission? <laughs> we need more than four weeks really to get it into our minds and into our hearts. But I'm only doing it because Peter does it. Peter takes so much time talking about submission. And then in verse 8, he says, to sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. That you might inherit a blessing. Here's the big picture. We are to receive an inheritance. We are to receive this blessing from God. And so we have redemption. And what is redemption? It's the reversal of the fall. It's the reversal of what happened in the garden that causes us to say, well, what's in it for me? What am I going to get out of this? Here's what I want. Uh, I, I, if I'm not going to get what I want, I don't know if I should do this. It's hard to give up our power and our control and be submissive. Because the fall causes us to turn inward. And what we want is power and control. And submission asks us to give that up. Why submission? For the kingdom of God. Uh, it's the most important thing is the kingdom of God. The most important thing you can do is to get yourself to heaven. And part of that is to submit to God's will. It's to submit to our government. It's to submit to uh, your boss. It's to submit to your spouse. Why? Because this is how folks learn the gospel. They see it in our behavior. Back in, in chapter 2, let me remind you what he says in verse 12. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that in the thing which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. How are the Gentiles being converted? By their observation of your behavior. And God is going to be glorified the day of visitation, the second coming of Jesus. 
He talks about that. Come down to chapter 12, uh, 2, verse 17. Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. He's talking about our behavior, the behavior that can be seen in others, the submission that we have in our lives. Is this easy? No, you know the answer to that. It's not. The suffering we're going through right now is not easy. But the way we respond to this difficult time can be the change that people see that makes a difference in their life. It might be the change that introduces them to the gospel. It lets them know that the kingdom of God is the most important thing in my life. Is the kingdom of God the most important thing in your life? Jesus is coming again. And paradise is going to be restored. I'm looking forward to that day. I hope you are too. May God bless you.